Good morning. <laughs> Page 251 in the Bible in your chair in front of you, we're going to read six verses from 1 Samuel 30. No guarantees on pronunciations. <laughs> now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against Negev and against Ziklag. They'd overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of the ball of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning them, because all the people were bitter in the soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself. Good work. Thank you. Interesting passages. That, that, that little scene of David's life is one of my favorite of David's life. Just how he... Re I'll, that's what I'm talking about today, so I won't start talking about it. Well, I guess I should. Anyway, um, welcome. Today, I want to convince you that compromise always leads to consequences. It's like if you're on a subway on the tracks. The subway is going to go where the tracks go. Subways don't divert from the tracks. Compromise always leads to consequences. So we're going to take a look at that. To do that, we're going to contrast Saul and David in specific real-life settings, and and um, going to look at that. But first, we are Grace Life Bible Church. We celebrate the grace that we have received because we have experienced it. We extend it. That's one of our things. And uh, we know we value knowing God and His Word. We value experiencing and extending God's grace, growing in healthy relationships, and then impacting. Basically, whoever God puts in front of us, and also people around the world that he's put on our hearts. So that's who we are. And our, our whole pyramid thing here, we have our values of knowing, experiencing, growing, impacting. And we develop individually, based on those values, we all develop our own rhythms of grace. Um, <clears throat> loving God through Bible study and prayer, extending grace and forgiveness to others, growing in healthy relationships. And serving others. And so our mission, what we're about is making disciples. We are each disciples becoming better disciples, learning about Jesus and um, um, believing in him and his word. And, and that's, that's, that's who we are. I just want to take a second here and kind of acknowledge in our broader culture, so many people are, are deconstructing their faith. And so many people have been hurt by the church. And I just want to say, I'm sorry if that's you, if that's you online. I mean, that's, uh, I've experienced institutional Christian hurt and that kind of hurt is the worst kind of hurt because we have fair expectations of being trusted and being cared for and loved. And then when some one or some institution compromises and we get hurt, um, a lot of people throw it in reverse and they just walk away from the church. Some people walk away from God. And so I just want to let you and online people know that I understand that kind of hurt, and, and we're not perfect people, but we rest on the grace of God. We're all in the middle of becoming like Jesus. No one's finished that yet, and so you're welcome here to maybe just sit, look, and, and just kind of relax and hear the Word of God, the grace of God, and hopefully that will, that will start a process of moving towards Him in a fresh way. Anyway, I just... Um, Observe that about our culture, okay? So, I'm going to ask one of life's most important questions. This is one of life's most important questions. It's the biggest little question you can ask. If you get this question right, everything else in your life is going to fall into place. Three simple words. Why be good? If you're good because you don't want to get caught, that's not going to work. If you're good because everyone around you is good... Well, eventually you'll find a reason. There's always some temptation that outweighs bad answers to that question. Maybe you've been brought up. Maybe you're compliant. Whatever it is, we're going to look at Saul and David in terms of this question, why be good? All right? So they each answered that in very different ways. And if you don't get this right... You're going to be like a guy I met on a on motorcycle ride once. A couple years ago, I went down to Kansas and hooked up with some guys riding motorcycles. And it's fun. You go just a lot of dirt roads and whatnot. And I met this guy at lunch. We stopped someplace. I don't know where. And he, he were talking. And he's a very interesting guy. He gives me his business card. And this was it. I had to block some things out because they weren't helpful. 
<laughs> but he's, he sells bongos, used cars, bail bonds, used guitars. Old dogs, used golf clubs. Water taxis, hearing aids, cash loans, used hockey gear. Tattoos, African tours, babysitting, very small swimming pools, leaky boats, hardwood floors, and llamas. <laughs> so it just occurred to me that, that if you don't know how to answer the question, why be good, you're gonna drift into this foundationless, selling leaky boats and llamas kind of a person. Okay, shall we close in prayer? <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, we do want to review. We've been going through, if you're just tuning in or visiting, we've been kind of marching through the Old Testament at a super high level, uh, focusing not on books in terms of theme, purpose, all that, but, but people, you know, like Abraham. So we looked at Adam and Eve, Noah, the sea by Noah. Noah had a covenant. And then from Noah, we went to Abraham. Abraham had a covenant. Blessing was the main thing with Abraham's covenant. Moses had a covenant. The law was the main thing with his covenant. We went through Joshua, Judges. We looked at the person of Gideon um, and Saul. And, and then to, today we're looking at the Davidic monarchy. So um, all of this Old Testament stuff, if, if you're new to the Bible, the, old, the Bible is broken up into two major parts. The first part is like two-thirds of it. It's the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. It's old because something new has come along that's better, that's su supplanted it. It's the New Covenant, and that's based in Jesus. So here's, a, here's an image that, that shows you um, everything in the Old Testament, the Law, the Prophets, Psalms, and the New Testament leads to Jesus. That's kind of the point of God giving us God's Word. And the story of Israel leads to the Messiah. So in all the failed kings, in all the backwards, weird judges, comes the, the cry and the pointing to Jesus, the perfect king that won't disappoint you. So this verse from Luke, uh, you know, these are my words as I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. I think that was the road to Emmaus, which is uh, one of my top 10 time machine kind of um, stops. All right. So how did we get to the monarchy? Well, you know, coming out of Egypt, they go to Sinai, they get the law. Now, Israel was supposed to be what's called a theocracy. Now, a democracy is where, you know, a lot of people rule an oligarchy. Let's say this section of the church right here that they ruled America. Okay. This would be called an oligarchy because certain people, a small group of people, it might actually turn out better. But anyway, I'm just saying that, that if one person rules, that's called a monarchy. And if nobody rules, that's anarchy. Well, there's this other word called theocracy, theo for God. So that's where God rules. And this is supposed to be Israel's model. So um, behind that question comes up whether or not Israel should have a king. And we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But God was supposed to rule. The king was supposed to answer to God and lead the people, the priests, the prophets. They were all together. So we, go, we, we, we establish the nation in Exodus. We get to Joshua. Here's an image of Joshua, the book of Joshua. I, I tried real hard to show you this up and down motion. Chapter 6, there was victory because there was obedience. Chapter 7, there's defeat because there's compromise. Chapter 8, there's victory because there's obedience. Chapter 9, there's moral compromise and there's problems in chapter. So it goes back and forth and that all shouts back to Deuteronomy 28, the covenant between the suzerain and the vassal, the, the overlord and Israel, and there's obligations and you promised and we have witnesses and I won't get back into that. But Judges, then the book of Judges, we have seven cycles of, of, of sin, servitude, supplication, salvation, satisfaction, and then it just keeps going over and over and over. And, and Judges is a weird book because it goes, it starts off pretty good. Like, like the guy, um, Othniel, you'd be like, okay, if you have a 15-year-old daughter, yeah, you can, you can, you know, hang out with him. Or maybe 18, I don't know, whatever. I don't know how that works with daughters, but you can hang out with him. But by the time you get to Samson, you're like, you ain't going out with him. Certainly not Jephthah, because she may never come home, okay? But so Judges goes from good to worse, and in the middle of Judges, we had Gideon. Gideon was that, that weird, pivotal judge that up to Gideon, all the judges had been good guys defending Israel from the enemy. Beginning with Gideon, he becomes the enemy. He introduces idolatry. He starts to kill and harm his own Israelites, and it just goes downhill. And the whole point of the book of Judges shouts, we need a king. Look at us. It's a mess. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on there. And um, 
The king thing, though. We need a king. That's what's, and this is, it's okay to disagree on this question. I've got a friend who, who thinks Israel should not have a king. I, I, I think Israel, the plan was for them to have a king, but obviously not replacing God. The, the king was subservient to God, leading the nation. And so here's, here's the question. Which was the most important to Israel? Prophets, priests, or kings? This is, this is on the test on Thursday, so this is a, a study session. Um, the answer is prophets. That may surprise you, but uh, the prophets speak from God to the king and to the people. Think of David and Nathan. When, when Nathan says, you the man! Uh, except, no, he's like, you're the man. Tone of voice is important, right? Inflections and all that. So the prophets were the spokes, the, the mouthpiece for God. And, and the priests were important. They're religious leaders and the kings are important. But really, uh, the, the prophets are important. So that's kind of where we've been. Uh, we're we're going to be in the book of Samuel today. Today we're talking about compromise and consequences. Compromise always comes with consequences. And I hope, I hope by the end of this, you, you'll open up to the idea that maybe compromise is sadly, more frequent in our lives than we might think, big and little, okay? And I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, going off to the deep end and doing crazy things. There's a lot of little compromises that we just find ourselves like we did, like yesterday. What happened? Well, how did, okay, so we'll, we'll go there and talk about this. So what are the keys to navigating spiritual and moral compromise? And what do your desires have to do with that riddle, okay? So, you've heard of A Streetcar Named Desire. It's an old movie. I've never seen it, but I looked it up, and sure enough, it's a movie. And the trailers, here's the funny thing. Trailers in style and substance have changed in the past 80 years. It's just, they're just weird. Anyway, there's a movie called Streetcar Named Desire, and there's also a subway called Consequences, right? And, and they're both on tracks, and they both take you to inevitable destinations of consequences. If you're on the subway, you, you're going where the subway's taking you, all right? And if you make compromises, it's like a subway, and there are going to be consequences. That's just the way it is. So here's the deal. Here's my bumper sticker. Maybe we can sell t-shirts at the end of the church, you know what I mean, for four payments of $19.99. But anyway, um, you can choose today's disobedience, but you cannot choose tomorrow's consequences. I'm going to say that again because that's worth remembering. You can choose today's disobedience, but you cannot choose tomorrow's consequences. I didn't make that up. It's just the way the world works, okay? So, um, but there's, we're talking about compromise. There's a couple different kinds of compromise. There's, there's good compromise, like in the political arena. I want 13 things. You, you, you want different things. Well, uh, if, you, if you give me eight, I'll, you know what I mean? And so that's good compromise. You just have to compromise you know, that's the process of that, okay? But if you're talking about I want, God wants, that's a, that's a bad compromise. Like if you're at odds with God and what he wants, that, that's so there's, there's moral compromise and there's like a political compromise. And, and so we'll just keep those separate for the sake. But if you are the kind of person that you don't know how to answer why be good, th this is your brain right here. You're down this dark hole of compromise, and you never know which way is up. You never know, am I on firm grounding or what? Do I? How do I make this decision? And, and everything's just kind of plastic and flimsy and, and just, just wishy-washy. There's no grounding, okay? So we want to answer the question, why be good, in a way that gives us clarity and confidence. And so, back to Saul. We did this last week two weeks ago because we had Easter, but uh, Saul was the wrong man, the wrong tribe, the wrong reason, the wrong time, and, and also the wrong position. He was supposed to be a prince. If you read Samuel carefully, Samuel is like, yes, and I will give you a prince. Uh, you're like a governor, a leader, a uh, commander. And they're like, no, we want a king. And very different things. And uh, the one displeased God. And so... Um, Anyway, he was, he was for the wrong reason. They said, hey, he's tall and handsome. We want him to judge us and fight our battles. He's tall and handsome. And not only that, but uh, we have battles. Why, why do you have the Philistines harassing you? Oh, that's right, because someone in the past has not fully obeyed. Samson was supposed to wipe him out. His lack of obedience creates their present hassle with the Philistines. And this is a pattern we'll see over and over and over. So they don't turn to God because of their distress. Remember what David did when he was distressed? He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Israel is in distress, and they go to a tall, handsome man, okay? Eh, nothing wrong with tall, handsome men, but anyway. Um, 
So we can be tempted to compromise when we're threatened, but we really should ask, why am I threatened by this? Why am I in distress? Is it in my rear view mirror, the answer that I've done something and this is, this is the mess I'm in? Or is there something else? We need to ask that question, okay? Um, we can be tempted to compromise because something looks good. He's tall and handsome. You know, the, the car is shiny and red. I, I just, I need, to, I need to buy the car. I need to, whatever it is. Um, so, the wrong man, the wrong time, um, the wrong position. And um, now we're going to kind of zero in on uh, Saul, the wrong man, and then shift over to David, the right man. So, Saul was the wrong man because he had defective desires. He, uh, he wanted power. And um, sort of like an idol, he manipulated to control his power and retain his power. And in the middle of this little dialogue here in 1 Samuel 15, here's a verse that's funny, um, funny, sad. Samuel rose early to meet Saul, and um, it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. You're just like, that's interesting. That that's just what Saul does. You know what I mean? It's about me. It's about my power. And, and he's threatened about the loss of his power. And um, so you can be tempted to compromise because you're afraid of losing something. This is his situation. Saul was the wrong man because he was fearful. He's afraid of David. He's afraid of the people. He's afraid of everything that he shouldn't be afraid of if he was a true leader. All right. Um, and he was the wrong man because he was disobedient. So in 1 Samuel 8, two weeks ago, that was the, the, the passage about, hey, um, the people said to Samuel, uh, your, your kids are a mess, which is a whole other story. They were a mess, but, but appoint for us a king. And, and here's, here's this. it says, it displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king. Samuel is in distress. What does he do? And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they've rejected me. And this is that little nugget of truth that's painful, that will blow your minds, it blow my, blows my mind, that sometimes God's discipline to us is giving us what we want when we have defective desires. And we're like, I want this, I want this, I want this. We got to have a king, we got to have a king. And God's like, yeah, no, you, you don't. But we keep asking, he's like, Samuel, zip it, give him the king. It's not what I want, it's what they want. Through that defective desire, they will be broken and hopefully return to me. Fascinating, all right? So, um, God was supposed to choose their king, not the people and the reasons and all, all these things. Um, but to understand Saul's story, we have to go back to what... Uh, John read about the Amalekites and what's going on with them. So 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 through 6, kind of now, now we're getting back to our, our, our reading. The Amalekites had made a raid on one of David's towns, and the Amalekites um, hung out in this area, the Negev, so just uh, south and little on the way to Egypt, south of the Dead Sea, Egypt. If this troubles you, it's a whole other sermon, but I have a lot of reasons why I think Sinai is there. But anyway, we'll move on. Um, and this is, this is the scene, as soon as they were coming out of Egypt, Amalek was there to pummel and pound and destroy Israel. And here's, here's a verse from uh, Deuteronomy 25. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off those in the tail. It means kill stragglers in the back who are alone. And those who are lagging behind you, he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. So this, the key thing is that therefore, when, when you're in the land and you have stability, God says, I want you to go back and be my instrument of judgment to these people that have centuries of brutality and perverted wickedness. And it goes on and on and on. I just, um, I'll just have to leave it at that. So, the, so. And in other places, God says, hey, Israel, it's not because you're so good that I'm using you to do these things. It's just because, because I'm holy and, and you're, in fact, a mess. Anyway, the battle of Amalek, this is where Moses is tied. Hold up your hands and you will win. He's, he's tired. His hands go down. They start to lose. And so they, they sit him on a rock and they, they hold up his arms and then they win. And so you, you got the Lego version and the artistic version there. That's what's going on there. But the, the Amalekites were the first ones to attack Israel. All right. And it says, when the Lord God has given you rest, that when is Saul's reign, 
Okay, this is Saul's command to do this. Hundreds of years later, this is what's going on, all right? And so then we have the second occurrence of Amalek in the book of Numbers. The Amalekites join up with the Canaanites and fight Israel. And then in the book of Judges, they, they, they team up with the Moabites and the Midianites and fight Israel. So they're just fighting and hating. So, so um, Amalek hates Israel, okay? Good, check that. Saul is charged with killing the Amalekites, based on Deuteronomy 25. So Saul's command, 1 Samuel 15, um, go and strike Amalek, devote to destruction all that he has. This is what the Lord has commanded Saul. Saul compromises. He allows the king, whose name is Agag, to live. I know it's kind of it's complicated, but Saul, God says, kill him. And, but, but what does that mean? It could mean so many things. Adjust, yeah. He, so Saul lets him live, and um, behind that is, is, and I don't know, but I'm. If you're a king and and you live and die by alliances and covenants with with other people, other tribes, other nations, and so if you're a king, you desperately want the admiration and power over another nation. So it would be advantageous to to Saul to have this vassal treaty thing with these lesser people that that honor him, that give him money every year, that 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 he can be like a big deal with, right? And if he's going to follow God and wipe them out, it's like, but, but there, there's resources there. See all this common sense that, that gets in his way. He plunders the good stuff and takes it for himself. He doesn't obey God. Here's what it says. Saul, Saul spared Agag and the best of the sheep. All that was good, he would not destroy. All that was bad and worthless, he devoted to destruction. And this is obviously not what God wanted. The, the first fruits of, of conquer, uh, conquered places like that were supposed to be devoted to the Lord and, and honor him for his hand, but he's, he's claiming that for himself. He lies about what's going on. Samuel shows up, and this is just an amazing um, scene here. Samuel said, Samuel came to Saul. Saul says, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the command of the Lord. And Samuel's like, well, then what's the noise of the animals? I, I don't get that part. And Saul says, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best. Remember Adam and Eve, that woman that you gave me, we still got it going on. The people, they did this. Yeah, aren't you the leader of the people? Sorry. Anyway, but he says, the rest we have devoted to destruction. They, but we, isn't that amazing? It's like, are you 11 years old? I mean, this is the, this is the thought process. Okay, he's the king, right? And Samuel says, stop, I will, and then he's like, yeah, he calls him, he holds him accountable, and Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned, I have transgressed the Lord because I feared the people. He is selling leaky boats and llamas. He has no foundation. He has no grounding to stand on and say, this is what I'm about. This is what I'm going to do. You follow me. You don't follow me. This is what we're doing. This is right. Okay. That kind of clarity. That's not what Saul has. All right. David did have that clarity for the most part. All right. So there's consequences. And then Samuel says, for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king. That's just the consequence. So there's a command, there's a compromise, and there's a consequence because cons compromise always leads to consequences. It's like a subway train, all right? So Saul lost the throne. He, uh, he attacked. Um, they did attack the Amalekites. Uh, about 400 of them remained. And so um, they go on, and there's ongoing consequences. So this is Saul became king about the year 1051. You don't need to know that, but sometimes I just have to get that in my head to keep the story straight. Anyway, 1051 BC. And so then 50 years later, David's king, and he runs into trouble with the Philistines. I'm sorry, with the Amalekites, okay? Now, if the Amalekites had been wiped out in the first place, they wouldn't be there to steal David's family in Ziklag, Right? So, so there again, we have, we have compromise leading to consequences. And sometimes, this is sad but true, sometimes you and I get hit by the consequence of someone else's compromise. And that's not fair. That's just not fair. It's just life in a broken world. Sometimes we get the bill for someone else's sin. We get hurt from, right? And so uh, it's sad but true. So 
David came to Ziklag, they, they raided it, they captured it. Now note David's response to being in distress. This is, this is where you want to focus and put this in your pocket and walk out the door and meditate on this all week. David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. That's a bad day. Because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. Do you know how to do that? I would imagine it would involve something like turning off my phone, opening up my Bible, and being quiet for a length of time to just sort of ask, Lord, where am I? Where are you? How are things going? I'm ready to throw the towel in here. The people are banging on the door want to kill me. Do you have anything for me? And, and getting into maybe Psalms. Because this is where David pours out his heart. And that's where we can emotionally connect with uh, the bad days like this. So David pursues them, kills most of them, but not all of them. So some of them live on, okay? Um, 300 years after David, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, kills a group of, of um, Amalekites living in the hill country. And then 400 BC. So now we're 600 years downstream from David and Saul. The book of Esther, the Amalekites show up again because Haman is an Agagite connected to the Amalekites. You know what Haman does? He wants to annihilate all of the Jews through King Xerxes. And so God intervenes and saves, and the big theme of Esther is reversal and, and how God is sovereign there, even though he's never named in the book. It's kind of a cool deal. Um, so it shows up in Esther, and then get this. King Herod descended from Esau, and if you go to Genesis 36, Esau's sons were Eliphaz, blah, 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 Amalek. Esau, Amalek, Herod. Herod tries to kill Jesus. So you've got this weird, ongoing, compromised consequence things starting way back with Saul. Wipe them out. David wiped out a lot of them, not all of them. They're there for Esther through Haman, and they're there in Herod through Jesus. And um, fortunately, that didn't work. But um, the, the lesson here is you can choose today's compromise, but you can't choose tomorrow's consequences. As David learned, he comes home, his family's gone. Okay? That, that, that wasn't his sin. It was something else that happened. So, whereas Saul was the wrong tribe, wrong man, wrong time, everything. David was the right tribe from Judah. Now remember, I didn't say this, but in the book of Judges, the way the book of Judges is written, at that time in history, Benjamin's the problem and Judah's the solution. Okay, everything is bad in Judges about Benjamin, and then you turn the page and, oh, Saul, the king from Benjamin. It, it, okay, yeah, anyway, um, the right man, the right time, the right reason that he's a king, not just a prince. David is the answer, and that is where we're going with that. So, and partly he's the right man, the right time, the right reason, because God chose him. If you remember Deuteronomy 17, the whole chapter, I'm sure you do, but the whole chapter is on how to pick a king. And, and the thing is like, it's, it, it, I need to pick the king, not you, I'm picking the king. Well, the people said we want a king and he's tall and handsome. Well, God didn't pick him. Okay, and so now God says about this little, Jesse, go get your boys, because one of them is going to be king. He lines them up, all the important ones, and there's like, uh, nope, nope, what tall, Ooh, nope, 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 nope. Is this all you got? Well, there's, there's a kid out, out back, the back 40, some sheep and stuff. Well, go get him. So they go get him, and he's just a little kid. And God says, anoint him, for this is he. God picked him, so he's the right man, the right reason, and so that is the beginning of David. The other, the other weird thing is that, that when David is out with the sheep, he's learning, he's meditating on God, and he's picturing God as a good shepherd. Because as a shepherd, he knows other people, like, like Farmer Jones over the hill, he's just a bad shepherd. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't lead his sheep to good water. He, and they're sick, and they're mangy. And so, so David understands a good shepherd, and he's like, hey, God is a good shepherd. I'm like sheep, and God is a shepherd. And so he's processing these deep thoughts, writing psalms, meditating, singing to the Lord. He, he's intimate with God. Saul at night has demonic visions of panic and terror and, and, and loss of his power. He's just fundamentally different. Okay, so anoint him. 
This is he. Now look at the other interesting thing about David and Saul is what they do with sin. And this, this is a penetrating practice for you to do in your quiet time. Look in the mirror of God's word and just ask, how am I responding to sin? Am I like Saul? I just kind of ignore it and brush it away. And, and, and viewing sin as it's kind of a, a bump in my road. It kind of slows me down from doing my thing. Or is it a personal violation of a good and holy God that hurts that relationship and you want to restore that relationship through his forgiveness. So here's Psalm 51, just going to read parts of it. This is after David sinned with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. See, David doesn't just think sin is something I did. David understands this thing is inside of me. I can't just undo it. I can't just do 13 good things to undo the 12 bad things. He's like, there's wash me from my sin against you. And you only have I sinned and done what is evil. Behold, you delight truth in the inward being. Like you want truth in here. I, I can pretend to be doing stuff out here, but, but that's not enough for you, God. You, you want truth inside. And he's like, that, that's where I went wrong. I went wrong inside with his desires with the whole Bathsheba thing. Purge me with his hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. See the inside? Where else can you go to say, renew my heart? Is there an app for that? I haven't seen that at Walmart. God is the only one that can renew your heart. And that's where our problem with our defective desires resides in our heart. So if you have defective desires, that's where you want to go. Spend some time with God receiving his forgiveness. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. So just an amazing Psalm 51. Maybe, that's, uh, maybe that should be on your to-do list this next week. To just Psalm 51. Meditate on that and, uh, and bring our junk before the Lord and let him, let him clean it. Forgive us. It's awesome. So David accepted responsibility for his sin and Saul doesn't. Okay, that's another, another big deal. So here's this Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. Um, so this, this big covenant to David, it's a very foundational deal. It's, it's, where, it's, it's where the Messiah comes from. Okay, just going to read a couple verses here from 2 Samuel 7, 13. David shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, with very interesting assumption. Oh, he will. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rods of men, the stripes of sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away before you. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Remember that verse in Hosea? I'm sure you do. Uh, Hosea 13:11. God is just kind of railing them about how disobedient they've been. And he says this, I gave you a king in my anger and I took him away in my wrath. That's talking about King Saul. I gave him to you in my anger. Oh, you rejected me and Samuel said, give it to him. I gave him to you in my anger. I took him away in my wrath. That's fascinating, right? So Israel compromised, not only David, but, but king after king after king, they compromise and they break the covenant. The old covenant is broken. It doesn't work. Nobody can, it's almost like judges extended. You know, judges is just this microcosm, just everything's bad, it's broken, we need help. And then you extend that out to the whole Testament. And there's little glimpses of good now, but it's just, it's broken. The whole thing is broken. And so because they broke the covenant, they are removed from the land. I'm going to shift gears into just an Old Testament overview of history. And so um, hopefully this doesn't blow your mind. But basically, um, the, the linear history through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all that's Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Okay. Now the monarchy, Saul, David, Solomon. This is the time of the monarchy, the book of you know, Kings and a bunch of Samuel. Now Solomon dies and the kingdom of Israel splits to Israel in the north and Judah in the south, okay? So Solomon dies, and now we've got Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Now, two key words that will be on the final test. Israel is annihilated in the north. Judah in the south is simply exiled. If you're annihilated, you ain't coming back. You're just gone. 
And for the rest of biblical history, Israel never comes back. 722 BC, nuked, done, period. Judah is disciplined, go away for 70 years in exile because of their sins, and then they come back. And so on this, this, this chart here, this, they return from Babylon. So there's, there's three key battles and there's three key returns, okay? Anyway, so I'm just trying to, and you remember the ABCs? I just love this. A for Assyria, the domination. B for Babylon, the domination. C for Persia, the domination because of Cyrus. You can remember the, those things and, and that's, I know it will, it will bless you. But anyway, so um, all of this to say is that, that the old covenant was broken and Jesus is the solution to all that was broken. It all, that big funnel, it all leads to Jesus. He is the new covenant. His blood, he says to his guys at the Passover meal before his crucifixion, my blood is the new covenant. And, and you know, we, we've been through the gospels a bunch of times and just like, what? They just can't figure it out. But now we can because we look back. And so we rejoice that Jesus is the new covenant. This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so Jesus is the new way to access God. That's, that's Mark's main driving point. That there's a new way to access God. John the Baptist talked about him. It's Jesus, this guy. And uh, at the end of Mark, the Roman centurion, surely this is the son of God. Great. I love Mark. So the covenant with Abraham about blessing, Jesus is the blessing. He is the one that blesses not just the Jews. In you, all families will be blessed. And Jesus is blessing all the families. He is the fulfillment of the Mosaic Covenant. Only Jesus can fulfill the law, right? He is the answer to the Davidic Covenant because he comes from the line of David. He has the right to rule. And so we're, we're seeing that uh, the Old Testament, especially the failures of the kings and the judges, um, lead our minds to the perfect king of Jesus. So it's interesting that Saul confessed. I mean, technically he did. Uh, and David confessed, but, but look at the differences here. Saul, after he sets up mo a monument for himself, um, he says, I have sinned because I feared the people. Um, and then he goes on and says, yet honor me now. 1 Samuel 15, 30. Honor me. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I did bad, but honor me. I, I want power back. David confesses. We've already read it. He's like, I know my transgressions in my heart. Can you renew my heart? Fundamentally different ways of confessing sin. And so that circles us around. How do you deal with your sin? Are you like Saul? Oh yeah, I just, I'm sorry. It was a mistake. Uh, yeah. Give me my money back. G give me my power back. Give me my relationship back. I want my job back. I want to promote whatever it is. We, we can fall into that trap or like David is just like, man, I'm way inside here. There's things that are just disordered and only you can renew my heart. So the difference is really motive. Where are they coming from? One wants power, one wants a relationship. Um, David has a transformed relationship. Saul has, I forgot the word, transactional. It's a transactional relationship. I do this, he gives me that, right? I do this, he gives me that. Transactional, it's just very superficial. If you're married, you, you don't want a transactional relationship, all right? I take out the garbage, you do this. And it, there's more to it than that, okay? Um, all right, so for the Christian, motive is everything. Why we do. If you have a motive problem, guess what? You don't have a motive problem. You have a love problem. If you have a sin problem, you don't have a sin problem. You have a love problem because our obedience is supposed to come from love, a heart of gratitude for who God is and what he has done, what he is doing. Not just transactional, he forgives my sins, so I got to go to this place every Sunday morning. That's, right? That's not how it's supposed to work. So love is really, so what's your motive for being good? Why be good? The circle around and close us up. Does God's goodness factor into why you should respond, why you want to respond? Is there a want in there? When you pray, are you only praying for deliverance? Give me my power back. Or is there, I, I love you and whatever else happens, I'm, I'm good because I have you, Lord. All right. Or do we cry like, like judges? Ah, we disobeyed. We broke the covenant. We're in a tight spot. Not sorry, but can you help us out? Okay. That's, that's like 
That's judges, all right? No, we, we want to be like David, crying about, about how we need to be clean and, and enter into his, his, the joy of the relationship. And I'm not, okay, so why be good? Um, that, that's, we always end up with a couple questions here. You can choose today's disobedience, but you can't choose tomorrow's consequence. It's just the way it is. So, why are you good? Is your relationship with God trans, transactional? Like, I do this, he gives me that. I'm like kind of mechanical. Or is it transformed? You understand the grace of God and you respond willingly to his goodness in the midst of your sin. How do you deal with or respond to God when you sin? That's, that's, um, those, are big, those are big deal questions, and we'll have to process them. Uh, maybe it'd be good to talk in your life groups, a small group. Just kind of bring that up and go like, well, I was thinking about this. What? So that's a uh, homework for you that you can do. Um, how do you navigate your own spiritual or moral compromise? Uh, and where do your desires, where do your desires factor in there? Um, what we delight in is, is really significant and we want to delight in the lord so uh we're i'm going to pray we'll have some quiet music and you can think about these for uh you know some seconds because our, our world is noisy and we don't have time to think much we kind of like to cultivate that here so heavenly father thank you for your goodness um somehow the bible is is so simple and yet to to, to get grace in my head and and to just have it motivate my walk with you seems so hard sometimes and so we're so prone to performance and transactions of i do this he does that and and all this stuff would you open our hearts and minds to understanding your character of grace and how that can be a powerful answer to the question why be good we want to be good because you are good and you have loved us with an everlasting love you have forgiven us you have blessed us you've given us your spirit you've done so much for us we we just stand in awe of your goodness and we desire you more than just what you give us. Amen.